It is uh, 12 o'clock on uh, Wednesday, February 1st. This is Finance Personnel Committee meeting. Uh, we have quite a long agenda, so we'd like to move right through it. Item number one, Fire Relief Pension Fund. Luke Draxon. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and council members for seeing us today. Um, as Jim stated, my name is Luke Draxton, and I'm the treasurer with the Fergus Falls Fire Department Relief Association. And as part of our annual um, reaffirmation process, we're here today to present the financial status of our relief association and our funded status, and hopefully bring forth information to request a pension amount change request. So after our relief association board met uh, about a month or two ago, and after careful consideration and in-depth review of the discussion regarding our investments and our available funding for our pension, uh, the board has recommended a $200 increase to our annual per year service pension amount. Um, and as part of the process, the council affirms this request and the pending affirmation would go into effect effective March 1st. Um, last year, our per year of service amount was 4,400 and the request would go from 4,400 to 4,600 per year of service for the Fire Department Relief Association. Does that go back to year one that, that uh, or does that start from this year on or how does that work? That's a good question. Yep, it goes back to year one of service okay. and we have a vested <clears throat> liability schedule. So from zero to 10, you're zero percent vested. Then from year 10 on, it increases your 60 percent vested and that's two percent per year up to 20 years and then you're fully vested at that point. Any other questions from any of you? Go ahead. Um, it, it, it seems like a fairly significant increase. It's like four and a half percent. Yep. Yeah, so what we, the it's parameters, yep, the parameters we put in place are, uh, the main number that we look at is our vested percentage. And what that is is our liabilities that we have per member per year of service uh, divided by our SBI investment account. And the percentage that we typically like to have is a 10% buffer. Um, we even more conservative like to have a 15% cushion. So what we had came with, came up with a couple years ago, I think it was three years ago, was to have that vesting number at 115%. And then if it was at that number, we would feel comfortable coming to the city and requesting a you know, $50 per year increase. Uh, however, this year, due to our investment performance and some uh, retirements, people in and out of the, the account, our liability number went up to 126%. So we feel with that cushion, when we enact that it brings our number back down to about 113 and then when we get our state aid it bumps it back up to 117 so it keeps us in that fairly comfortable range um, and we don't want to be shortchanging any of our uh, you know members currently if it's you know just the per year of service amount is we like to keep it in that 115 range and this would allow us to with that number it brings us back to where we'd like to be mm. so thank you do we have a motion to recommend to the council? I'll move. So a second. second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Carried. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Library project lobbyist. Bill Sum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Within your packet, you should have a memo uh, that we put together. Um, this is coming back to Finance Committee. You talked about this at your last council meeting. So um, I'm just going to run through that memo here a little bit. Um, we're talking about the library sales tax um, that's been introduced at the state legislature. As you recall, um, the community voted uh, in regards to having a sales tax for our um, library expansion project. And that took place, of course, in November of 2016, and 66% of the voters that voted on that um, voted yes to that. So it passed with a 66% yes vote. Um, so that's for that half-cent local option sales tax. Now, of course, in order for this um, project to go forward and this sales tax to get put in place, it has to go through the legislature. And um, the legislative session ends now on May 22nd. That's the constitutional deadline, I believe, for the legislative session. So it is currently before that legislative session. Now, um, staff, so Andrew, myself, Aaron, we are recommending that you hire uh, Joel Carlson, our current lobbyist, at $10,000 to do the lobbying effort um, 
for this project. Some of the um, items to note in this memo that um, you know, local legislators, city staff, and council members, you know, we all play a role in this process, certainly. Um, but it's important to have a lobbyist down at the state of Minnesota for, um, you know, that lobbyist is meeting legislators in the hallways. They're attending all the meetings. Um, you know, they're the, the feet on the ground for us, um, in essence, when that happens. So certainly to track that piece of legislation and attend the relevant meetings, be available to the legislators and communicate and illustrate our city support for the project. Uh, communicate any questions, issues with the city that come up during the session regarding the um, legislation, and then to be present when those votes take place down at the state. So their presence is there, and when they see Joel, they know Fergus Falls is here. Um, so as you know, um, we have contracted with Joel Carlson for the last 14 years to work on a number of issues for us, um, from Prairie Wetlands, the Tower Road Bridge, the RTC, quite a bit on the RTC, and then the previous sales tax for the community arena. I hope I didn't miss any project there, but that's the ones we've used him on before, um, and we've been pleased with his services. So we recommend that you go forward with this contract. Um, we feel we've built, built a good reputation with him at the state legislature um, as far as associating who our lobbyist is. So that's, that's our rationale um, for that recommendation. And Peg Werner is here too if you have questions for her and she could elaborate a little bit more um, if you'd like on the, the importance of having a lobbyist um, at this time, I guess, to, you know, we're, the project is, this is the last, we're in the home stretch, you could say. Um, to breaking ground on this project in the spring, so this is our last um, hurdle to get over is to have this legislation passed. So, Peg, to come on up, please. For the record, well, I'm not that tall. <laughs> <laughs> For Luke the record. <laughs> And he was over it. <laughs> For the record, my name is Peg Warner, and I'm here as a citizen, but also I'm the director of Viking Library Systems, so my knowledge comes mostly from that. Um, I've certainly worked at the legislature and with legislators for 24 years. Um, I've spent a couple of sessions when I represented broadband and then when I was MLA legislative chair there for most of the session. And when you're there for most of the session, I think the most fascinating thing is to see how much of what the legislators do and how much of uh, the lobbyists do that is silent. There's absolutely no words going back and forth, but everybody knows, well, you learn gradually what's going on. I was in enough um, just meetings, committee meetings and that kind of thing, when somebody would come in and, and tap a lobbyist on the, on the shoulder and he was out the door. They don't do that anymore, it's all text, so they look down at their lap and they're out the door anyway, because something is out happening someplace else. And so um, I read the article in the paper about um, the cons reconsideration of this lobbyist, and so I called my lobbyist friends in um, St. Paul, because I wanted to see what they say, and so I just asked about Joel Carlson. I don't know him. I've never met him. I've never worked with him. And they said three things sort of across the board of the people I talked to. The first was League of Minnesota Cities. They said, well, he's a League of Minnesota Cities guy. And what that means is he has a network of League of Minnesota Cities people across the Capitol at all times that know what he's working on. So that's part of the network. The second thing they said is that he's well-liked, and I thought that was an, an interesting thing for lobbyists to say, not something I expected. But again, it's the same kind of thing. They're watching out for him because he's somebody that they enjoy working with. And the last thing was Fergus Falls. They said Fergus Falls. They knew that he represented Fergus Falls. I know he represents a number of things, so it may be that because I was calling and they knew where I was from that they said that's definitely something that we associate with Joel, with Fergus Falls. The important thing th about that is that when he's in an audience of any committee hearing, particularly when they're bringing up a bill, he's going to sit in a certain place. Lobbyists sit where they can be seen by all of the people. When he sits down in the room, they come early. When, when the omnibus tax bill comes up, they come really early because they want to sit where they want to sit. They establish eye contact with every single legislator in the room before the meeting starts, particularly the chair. So they're saying, I'm Joel Carlson and I am here. And then when they get to things, they see Fergus Falls has a sales text. They think Joel Carlson, Fergus Falls, he's here. You've told them that this is important enough to you to hire lobbyists to follow the thing up to be there. Um, one of the things I've heard is that, that this should be a slam dunk. 
And I agree. Goodness sakes, it's a local sales tax. 66% of the people approved it. It's a regional project. Pardon me, but it's a library. <laughs> and so that it should be a slam dunk. The reason things fall apart at the legislature, in my observation, is not doesn't have anything to do with them. They fall apart because of what's going on at the legislature. In my history, it has most often been a twin stadium or a Viking stadium. But there are other things that just send the <coughs> legislature in ways that you don't expect them to go. The omnibus bill, tax bill, happens at the very end. It'll probably happen May 21st. And it's going to have so much in it. And sales tax, local sales tax, is not going to be the focus. There's going to be something else that's going on. So they're going at this at the end. I think that sort of tenor between the governor and the Speaker of the House before the legislative session started kind of told you how this is going to go. They're looking at spending, he's looking, governor's <coughs> looking at spending a lot on education. The House is looking at tax relief. All of those things tell you that the tax bill is going to be tough. And so what you want to do is know that your part of the tax bill is covered so that when it comes up, nobody has anything to say except go on, go on, which means that they passed it, they know it's going to be there. And that's what Joel will do for you. He'll do it for you every day in the tunnels, in the elevators, in other committees. They will see him there and they'll know why. He'll stop them in the hall and say, you know, in Fergus we got that sales tax going. That's all he'll say. He won't present big, long rationale. He doesn't have to. He will do it once. Once he will go in and show why it's a regional um, project. Library circulates 50% of what they circulate outside the city of Fergus Falls. That alone tells you this is a regional project. That's all they need to know. Citizens passed it 66%. They will know all that before he gets there. And so then if things are a little tough when they get to the omnibus bill and they get to the sales tax part, all they're going to do look, is look up, look to his seat, he's there. But what he's saying is it's important to Fergus Falls. They don't care that Joel is there. He's not involved in any kind of political problems with anybody. He's just a neutral guy. But what he's saying is Fergus Falls cares about it. I know you want to get right through your agenda, so I'll say this part real fast. I'm a big supporter of, of Fergus Falls itself. I think that the discussions you've had recently, the things I read in the paper particularly, the RTC I think is still being handled really well. Um, but it's the riverfront development that interests me that I've seen. Those 100 people that came and were part of the riverfront development, I think that's the kind of thing that this is just sort of the launching pad for. So if you're a legislator, and those legislators sit around and talk about cities, they talk about their cities, I mean like all of them, like anybody from anywhere will say my cities in, in Minnesota, that means us. Um, they're looking at how well we're doing, whether or not we're going to be developing well. They're looking about what the, what the state is going to look like. And so they watch, and they watch things like this, and what they see is a project brought about by the citizens, a project by 66%, a project that's, that the city supported so much that they sent their um, lobbyists to be there to support it, and it shows you as a city on the move. And now you've got this project going in Fergus Falls that is um, supported by everybody. It's supported by the city and the people and all folks, and it's going forward, and now you're talking about something else. Now you're developing the riverfront. Now you're developing trails, and they see that as a city on a move. So I think that, that what you're doing now is exactly what you want to do to launch yourself. Um, you have a new mayor. I mean, who, who gets more excited about anything than Ben? And so I think that it's just the time to do, sorry, to do all of, it, <laughs> to do all of these kinds of things, and this is it. And it's how you do it. That's all I can say. It's how you do it. I've watched and watched and watched. And I've watched community groups come down with all of their heart and soul. And then they go home, and then it doesn't happen. Um, sales tax can come up on a Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock. And if it does, everybody, every lobbyist in that capital is going to hear sales tax and they're going to text Joel and he's going to be there. You could be on your way back to Fergus at that time. That's why you have a lobbyist there. It's all a game. It's all a dance. It's all invisible. But it's so important. Thank you, Tate. Do we have a motion to uh, hire Joel as our lobbyist for the lobby? Or second. I, I don't, I, I, you know, I'm not going to second that. I will second it. Is there any discussion? I, I, I was. I still think it's a lot of money. You know, basically on. <coughs> you know, we're, we're paying him thirty-two thousand already for the RTC. 
and then there's another 10,000 for this, and you know, then the Nancy Hayden kind of quote was, you know, she would do it for, for a thousand, and I just I don't think it's a lot of money for for something that is essentially tacking on to what he's doing. We're already paying him to be in the room, and so my problem is the amount of money. But if you look at at the scheme of things, that's one hundred of one percent yeah, I'm, of I'm, the total project. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not arguing that. <laughs> I, I'm just. I'm just arguing that it's ten thousand dollars. That it's a lot of money for, for you know, how many hours is it going to take him? You know, what's the hourly rate that he charges? It seems like it's a number <clears throat> plucked out the air. Mr. So. Chair, if I may respond, um, just for context, when we did the sales tax for the community arena, we paid, I believe, thirty-three thousand dollars. Is that correct, Bill? I believe so. Um, so, so that that number is significantly <laughs> lower now. Um, as Peg alluded to, the the lobbyist thing is kind of a full time gig, so I think it'd be tough to do an hourly rate. It's it's a, whenever you run into a legislator, um, you're having a conversation. It could be an all day everything gig, and and I think the nature of this type of project with an omnibus tax bill, which is generally the biggest bill of any session, is is where the complication comes in and where that higher dollar amount comes in. Um, and then, you know, I certainly don't want to get into a discussion about one lobbyist versus the other, but the, the Nancy Hilden proposal, that $1,000 was in addition to if we went with her proposal. So um, to say she would do it for 1000 I don't know if that's the case now based on, uh, you know, not getting the other job. But um, she she said she would add that to her scope of services for an extra $1,000. And, and if we were to have utilized her for both portions of her proposal plus that thousand, we'd we'd be significantly higher than what Mr. Carlson's at with both uh, contracts. Those figures, can I ask a question, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. I think that I wanted to thank Ms. Warner for her service and, and her passion for the city. And um, having used the library since I was a little shaker, I appreciate the library a lot. Yeah. Um, and my concerns that I did raise and were raised uh, by others uh, subsequent to the council meeting are one, the cost, again, uh, to the points Anthony made, <coughs> but also um, having you know, contact with Bud Nornis and others, I haven't seen or I haven't heard and maybe um, others have heard this, but I haven't heard that there is an alarm about this passing that, that is, as Ms. Warner said, this is a strong <coughs> movement. That, and so we're in the unenviable position as counselors to be representing all of the children at Fergus Falls, that is, all of the projects we have going. And I had a major businessman cross the street a couple days ago and talk to me and saying, you know, that $10,000 might be used in a better way and that, you know, we do have this initiative going forward. We have Bud, who's a, you know, a senior, a senior uh, member down there and, and very powerful at this point. Uh, and, I'm, and as well as Senator Inga Britson, who's very friendly and, and supportive of our proposals. So the question, that, I mean, their comment was, why do we have to spend that extra 10000 So my question would be um, that I would like to ascertain um, as to this project cost that, and this is maybe a question for, for uh, Mr. Somnor, but if the project goes forward, um, is the city reimbursed then from the bond monies for this lobbying cost, or is this a, going to be a, a city general budget expense or some other? This would be included in the in the project costs. So that's so. what we did with the arena as well. And then the funding sources for the project are those fundraising dollars and the bond then as well. So on a real technical side, it would probably come out of the fundraising bucket, you yeah. would say. Um, okay. And then I don't... The yeah, I, I think out of that bucket, even though it's a combined bucket when we ultimately fund the project. The follow-up then, Mr. Chair, is if, if in the unenviable and negative scenario, you know, worst case, that it, we didn't get it somehow, yep. something weird happened, which I, I doubt, you know, I'm 99% sure it won't, would the city be reimbursed from the funds or the, I think there's $1.25 in escrow with the city, would Correct. that come out of that then? Yep, that's where we would So the taxpayers wouldn't it. be... Because keep in mind, we have done, you know, design development and right. all those services. We're three to $400,000 into the project so far. 
if everything fell apart at the last moment, it didn't go forward, we'd have to, we still have to fund those project expenses and those would have to come out of the money that we have in the city coffers right now for this project. Because then we wouldn't bond for, for anything. Right, okay. I guess one, one thing I would like to say is that the, uh, the people of Fergus Falls voted for this 66% of the people out there voted for it. If we don't use a lobbyist and it falls through, we're going to be uh, in a heap of hurt as, as a council. I mean, people are going to be mad because 66% of these people want this library to go. And I think we should do all we can do to make sure that it does. And hiring a lobbyist, I think, is, is the way to go. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, the, the citizens that I've spoken to um, that have <coughs> been library project supporters uh, have said that it's with the, the thousands of hours and many years of work that have gone into the project that this is um, an acceptable price to pay to make sure to do everything we can to ensure its completion. Any other discussion? No. Just one other, uh, one other point, I guess, to Andrew's <coughs> point on the cost overall, um, depending on the lobbyist use. You know, that there are options that we would have that would, I think you said would be significantly more, um, you know, with that if we hired uh, the other lobbyist. For both phases, yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, from my addition that I have, or the math that I did, Joel was uh, originally for the one project was 35, right? Two. 32. <clears throat> yep. And then 10 additional is 42. Yep. And then Miss Hilden was 22 for the the half session. If or, I mean the session, not the full year. Yep. And then she would do the library for a thousand with that. Or if we did the whole year, it was going to be 40. Seven. Seven. Forty-seven thousand so versus forty-two. So forty-eight. So, or yeah, five thousand dollars. So five thousand dollars difference. Difference is what I just wanted to establish yep. what the difference yep. was if yep. we did the whole year. And I realize we're getting Joel for the whole year, so I'm not disputing that. Right. So thank you. All right. Hearing no further discussion, the call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Aye. Aye. We will send it to the council without a recommendation okay. from this committee. Going on with the Bill Sonmore show. <laughs> <laughs> Utility right. rates. All right. I know um, you want this meeting to truck along a bit, so I'm going to try to get through this. We have a lot of slides to go through. Um, but my hope is that we do some of the heavy lifting here, go through this utility rate analysis, and then we probably wouldn't go through it in detail at the council meeting. Maybe if there's a couple highlights or questions you'd have at that time. But um, We've been looking at utility rates over the last year, even, even longer. Um, and in particular, um, in-depth studies now um, over the last month um, where we're kind of finalizing things. So this is the culmination of many months coming together and looking at our funds. Um, so our city enterprise funds, um, for some of you that are new, what we're looking at is we have a refuse fund, we have a collection service then, within that recycling, demolition debris, that's out at the landfill, that's the big hole in the ground where the demo debris goes, roll-off services, and then various landfill services, you know, your metal recycling, your appliances, your trees, your composting, all that. We have a sewer fund, a stormwater fund, and then a water fund utility. These funds run as private businesses where the users that consume the services pay the cost of that fund. No tax dollars go into these funds. It's just the opposite. We transfer so many money out of these funds to our general fund. So I like to start with the big picture, where are we going with this? So currently, um, if you are a resident and you consume 6,000 gallons of water per month, that is about a, a household family of four. Is that right, Beth? And I should say, Beth, our utility billing um, person is here, and Sandy, our assistant finance director. They've worked with me a lot on this as well, and I thank them for that. So, so for a family of four, uh, the current bill would be 9347. With everything that's built in here, it would go up to 98, 93, or a 5.84 percent. 
So that's what the recommendation is. And now we're going to go through and explain what that is and, um, and why some of that is needed. So the previous times we changed rates. Water, it's been since May of 2015, so it'll be just about two years. Sewer, April of 14, so about three years. Stormwater, two years again. Refuse, we did last year, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And recycling, we have not changed the recycling fee since 2006, so we're looking at 11 years on that one. And one portion within refuse was looking up today was back to 06 as well. Um, we'd like to show you some charts of where we fall. Um, AE2S, they're an engineering <coughs> firm out of Fargo and the Twin Cities that um, does a survey of Minnesota and some of our surrounding states and where we fall. You can see Fergus Falls at 67.77. We're right about in the middle exactly from the lowest to the higher end. And this is Minnesota excluding Minneapolis and St. Paul. So just to kind of keep us in perspective of where we fall in the state. Now we have a few on refuse collection because we have lots of different um, changes to talk about here. But So effective January 1st, so a month ago, Ottertail County garbage disposal rate increased from $82 to $88 a ton. That's a 7.3% increase. So when we go around and collect our garbage from all our residents and we drop it off at the transfer station to dispose of it, we now will be paying $88 a ton instead of $82 a ton. So that's certainly a driving factor in our refuse fund with you know, experiencing costs going up. That's why we changed rates last year, if you remember. We had a significant, I'm trying to remember if it was about a 16 to 18% increase in that tipping fee. Therefore, we increased our refuse rates a year ago um, to make up, you know, to compensate for that. Now, the 35-gallon can option, we've talked about that some throughout um, council, throughout some of the annexation. Um, Right now, you can have a 65-gallon can or a 95-gallon can as your normal residential service. Um, it's been brought up if we could look at doing a 35-gallon can option. So if we do that, um, this would actually result in a reduction in annual revenue of $72,000 a year. And that's if we make an assumption that 25% of the customers choose to go to a smaller can their bill then would be $6 less is what's happening. So less garbage, um, less bill, but less money coming into the fund. So that's a factor we had to build in to deal with this. Um, so we would then estimate that we'd need to purchase 1,000 of those 35-gallon cans, and that would cost us about $40,000. That's built into the scenario as well. I did include Woodland Heights now that they are um, part of the city, and all those residents now have garbage service and recycling. They're, I added revenue in for their additional revenues that have come in, so we built that in. And then a decrease of 572 tons of garbage. This is if we're going to implement single sort recycling in July of 2017 is our goal. Um, and I have a little bit on another slide for that. We're thinking recycling will go up 50%, and that's what we've heard from some other cities. The experience, when you go to single sort, someone that's not recycling now is more likely to recycle if you go single sort because they could dump it all in one container. We're thinking that's going to take 572 tons of garbage out of the waste stream, and we'll be able to recycle that. So those tipping fees to Ottertail County, um, now we're pulling 572 tons out of that, so that increase we're receiving going to $88, now I'm backing off $50,000 from that. So we're not increasing our rates so much because we're, hope, you know, we're, we're looking towards um, some savings in that. So offsetting some of that increase in the actual tonnage rate. Long story short on that, 2% increase in the residential commercial fee, 2% increase in the disposal instead of the 7.3%. And one other thing. Um, I include, I go out 10 years on this, and I include inflationary increases throughout. And you'll see another slide on that later. Yes, thank you. This is really good. Um, one question I have, Mr. Chair, is go ahead. if we um, look at this, the trend in tipping fees and where the, we're going with disposal and all this stuff, would you say that you're on the conservative side? And I think that's your nature. I know you do a good job of that. But in terms of estimating the savings by recycling to us that we, in the, you know, in the next 10 years, 
yeah. if, if you look at where tipping fees are going and, and all this stuff, whatever. You want to just comment on that? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. I typically take a conservative approach on any of these scenarios because um, it is my nature. On this one, I don't really know how to answer that because Guy just did some research and talking with other cities, their experience. So um, we took that that increased 50%, but I didn't start building in increasing and recycling beyond that. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, the reason so, I ask is that, yeah, that the I think the inflationary costs are important, but yep. I would also think we should footnote that the fees for garbage disposal have been increasing much more rapidly Absolutely. than inflationary. Yep. So a note that that actually could be a low figure. I mean, we could be saving more. It's just a benefit to going to the recycling. Right. And from the, 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 the seminars I've attended, uh, they say the cities that are looking 10 years out to get ahead of this curve are going to be way ahead because of the cost to, of disposing of okay. anything. So just. So the good news on that is as we do this every year, we go through these. So as we start gaining that experience, we are certainly going to adjust those so that we don't stick our head in the sand and say, well, I only said 50% the first year. No, if it's 60, if it's moving towards 70, we're adjusting that way in future right. years. Yeah. So. Um, Bill, that $72,000 figure, is there a uh, appreciable decrease in the amount of uh, waste generated with the 35-gallon cans that would offset any of that revenue reduction. So there's, you know, so so the smaller can will be less garbage. Correct. I mean, is there is there an appreciable difference in what we're paying to dispose of it that would offset that $72,000 at all? Um, not really. Okay. Because right now, and that's a good question. Right now, those people that would be going to a smaller can aren't probably filling their cans now. Sure. So we're probably, the same amount of garbage is going to leave the city. The only way we start pulling that out of the waste stream is if it's going somewhere else. Thus, the single sort recycling and pulling it out of the waste stream. Okay. Thank you. I think. That's just thinking on the fly. Yeah, I, was, I was about to mention we could use a smaller can at, at our house. And, and uh, I mean, you're going to have the same amount of garbage from us, whether we have the bigger can or the smaller can. I mean, that's not going to change. You're going to have to wait to see what the council says on that. <laughs> That's what I'm telling I, I everyone else. Because <laughs> we get asked. That. I'm, just, I'm just saying that, that we could use a smaller right. can than what we have. That's why we're saying at least maybe 25% of the, of the households, it's potential they would go to a smaller can. We have no, that was just a yep. number we pulled out of the air. Yep. Okay. More. What, what about mechanically? I mean, if you go to a, obviously a, a can that's kind of half a size, I mean, is there a retrofit cost to the trucks? No. Uh, okay. The same truck will be able to it just, that. Just that yeah. you'll have to inventory two different styles of can. Well, three different styles three of can because you're going to have a recycle, or well, actually probably four. Yeah. You have a, a recycle, a normal, small, and a big, big. Yeah. And we'll talk about that when we get to the next slide. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so we have to be careful we don't add costs to try to save costs. Right. So we come to the recycling slide, and I'm going to tell you how we're adding some costs by doing this. Yeah. Just what you're saying. Um, so. Again, I said we're implementing that single sort. We would do an every other week pickup, not every week. Um, so every other week, um, we're looking at these would be 65 gallon containers. So the size of the lower garbage can right now would be the recycling. So you'd actually have you know, a good sized recycling container. Um, every other week, we are purchasing that. It's gonna cost the city $30,000 to get into this. Ottertail County has a grant for this, so our matching funds are 30,000. That's built into the scenario. Okay, the recycling program, the way we do it is that side load truck. Now, we have increased costs with that because a side load truck is more expensive than a one ton truck pulling a trailer um, and the maintenance on it and, and all that going forward. So I've actually increased um, the equipment cost to this module of the, of the business um, to account for that. Um, we would probably, we're getting a new refuse truck this year. We would not trade one in. We would have that one refurbished as the plan. Those costs now would get allocated to the recycling program. Again, it's higher, so I actually have an increase in cost there. We did decrease the expenses in recycling for um, staff time because now we, we figure the person running that truck will be busy you know, in those two week routes but we won't have to bring other staff into that. So we were able to eliminate staff that are working in that area, their hours there. So 
we brought some costs down in that. Bill, <coughs> would that be one truck and we now have two trucks running? Or do we have just one truck running for recycling? We have two one tons with the two full trailers, yeah. Okay. So yeah, it would be eliminating. So it one. would be just one truck. Right. Okay. And then you have another rear load truck that works in recycling to go and pick up those commercial routes. The commercial routes. So okay. that Which stays the same, but it's right. the single yeah, sort yeah. that's changing. And there we talked about our 50%, 572. Now the proceeds from recycling, don't laugh at me, it's not much, but it should go up. Um, right now we collect 3,500 a year from the sales of recyclables. Not a great market for that. Um, going up 50% then is, I mean, it's just that simple, you know, translation. Going up to 5,250. Again, these are all assumptions. Thus, I'm looking at raising the um, recycling rates from 540 a month to $6. Um, commercial then from 682 to 758, so they're going up the same percentage. And the last time we changed recycling, remember, was 11 years ago. So we have held that um, static for 11 years. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Um, so the recycling's got to get sorted at some point. Is Correct. there increased labor cost that we're paying for? No. Okay. That's at Otter Tail County, right, Guy? They w okay. We will drop it with them, and they do, the so they do the sorting. Okay, and they don't charge us any more for the unsorted recyclables? Right. Oh, okay. Thank you. Can I just speak to that, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Having gone to Purim and then the dirty sort that they have, we would have a clean then because we'd be getting benefit back from that. And so the county is glad to have that because they get an increased, you know, usage of the perm facility. And if we were, if it was in this area, let's say, or in Fergus, you know, then we would have that benefit of providing them with more and, and getting back then the clean. Okay. So it's just a longer term, yeah, mm -hmm. but it, it fits together. So it's a win-win overall. Yeah, so this is a, I mean, this is a great partnership with Otter Tail County. So they're paying the bulk of the cost of the containers for us. Um, you know, 30,000 is a small matching portion of that, so. So that's recycling. Um, tree management, we've talked about that over the last year or so. We've included an estimate for a contract grinder, basically, to, to grind every quarter. Um, we're estimating 60,000. We're recommending we implement that fee of $1.50. We've talked about that here and there. That's built into this. That would be a new fee on the utility bill. Um, part of the refuse fund, and you that was on that first slide, so that's in the increases here. Um, Guy has been doing some exploration on the burning of it, but we're not there yet. As you know, last year we spent, I think, 113,000 grinding trees, so we're looking at to manage this tree business. Um, we need to have a revenue source to pay for it, so we're recommending at this point that flat fee, yes. There's not everyone that has a tree in their yard. But this, remember, 80% or so of the trees coming into the landfill are boulevard trees. So it's part of the group, you know, paying to help fund to manage the, the trees as a whole for the city. Um, demolition debris. These, um, any rate changes here wouldn't come into play until 2018. But it, we put it in the scenario because we wanted to study that and give that to you. <coughs> Looking at major improvements, we've talked about this over a year ago, but $937,000 done over a couple years here. Um, I have cell 3A and then another portion of that, some of the improvements get depreciated longer. We'd have to issue bonds for that for $950,000. We're having everything match the 10-year term of the permit because as you know how we struggled on our last time renewing that permit, what's going to happen 10 years out. So to try and recover all costs for that improvements that were going in that 10 year period. Again, this would go into effect next year. We will restudy it again um, when we get dialed in on this a little better, but wanted you to be thinking about this. Significant increase, you know, from $16 to $22 a, a cubic yard. You know, this is if someone is, you have a contract job, um, remodeling, you know, roofing, all those kind of things that's where the fees, they would basically get passed on in a lot of those jobs, I'm sure. Um, and then going out there, um, further increases through 2027 is what I anticipate now, if this all comes to fruition like this. Certainly Brian, our city engineer, will be looking at this further. The roll off, um, you have a handout. It is the one that looks like this, the eight and a half by 11. 
Um, so these are the big 20 and 30 yard containers. Uh, we are now in the process of starting to replace those. They're starting to wear out. We have 50 some of those containers in our fleet. We're doing four to five a year at about 20 to $25,000 a year. So we built that into the scenario as well. Um, and then roll off e um, equipment costs going up as well. If you'll recall in the budget process, I reallocated equipment. We did a study of where is all our equipment being used and trying to make sure we're charging those divisions of the city appropriately. Um, we went a few years with doing you know, inflationary increases and then we kind of reset this year. We'll do that every few years. So roll off going up. So on here, that's where I put in red what the new rates would be. Um, dumpster, um, the per month minimum rent going from 12 to 15. Then the roll-offs, you can see 20 and 30 yard. If you have it one to seven days, going from 15 to $18, 18 to 21 for the 30 yard, you can see the rest of them. The pick charges, um, so when we go out, these are special um, orders. You know, we call, I need a dumpster for a week and I'm gonna come out, you know, have you pick that maybe twice during that week. Well then it's, I'm going from 35 to 40, $2 for that trip to go and pick that. And then a roll-off going from 100 to 120. Um, the last time those roll-offs, that $100 fee was increased, it went from 85 to 100 back in 2006. So today recommending to you going from 100 to 120, um, 35 to 42 for the um, dumpsters. So that's the roll-off scenario and I didn't want to try to get all that on a slide and that's why you have a handout for that. Again, special projects kind of thing. This is not a route service. Okay, at the landfill, we're looking at replacing the compactor with a screw type compactor where you can dump everything together. You can put mattresses and chairs and everything in with the mixed municipal solid waste, grinds it all up, compacts it in this covered roll off so it doesn't get rained on and we're not disposing of water weight out in Gwinter. So I'm anticipating that um, we would have savings from the trips out to Gwinter, cutting them in half because we can, you know, fit more when it's all compacted and ground up. So that's an $8,500 savings and then reducing our disposal by 20%, maybe another conservative estimate, we'll see, <laughs> um, $4,500 savings. So we'd like to do that. I think that makes some good sense um, because you don't want to pay for water weight. We're, we're disposing by the ton when it goes out there. Winter, of course, is better because it's not wet, you know, but of course summer, people are probably a little busier getting rid of stuff. Okay, so all that paints the picture of how we looked at refuse. And I'm sorry, this is, um, it's in depth. <laughs> so this is a history of the refuse fund. Um, through 2016, what we're estimating, I won't go into the nuts and bolts of what went up and went down. We can go through that if you have questions. Um, we can certainly explain all that. This is where we're at today. You know, operating income 205,000, change in that position 26. The difference between those bottom two lines, a lot of that's operating transfers out. So that's paying administrative costs to the general fund as well as interest on bonds. Um, things that are not related to operations. So that's why the change there. Okay, if we didn't do any increases, but everything we've built in, you can see the purple bar start, starts stepping right down every, every, um, every year. This is because we're estimated that inflation keeps going on expenses, but if we choose to never do anything with revenues, we're gonna spend our savings account in essence. That brings us to the next one. The blue line going down would be our current cash balance and how that would then drop. The kind of pale green on the bottom, that's closure, post-closure. We are required by law to um, plan for our landfill 30 years after it's been closed. So when we close this landfill in 98 years, we're planning for the 38 years that, the 30 years that follow. So I need to be building cash to take care of that now, as well as opening and closing the interim cells. You know, 200,000 here, close another one for 200, open another, making sure we have cash to do that as we go along. Here's the capital improvements for refuse. Um, you can see I talked about in 17 and 18 doing that big project related to the demolition cell and related to our permit, that whole MPCA discussion we had. And then you have 
2018, 200,000 closing a cell. 2019, opening a new one. Those kind of things going on. And then I made a note on the bottom, this continues in 26 and 27 and thereafter, of course. But I was projecting out to 2027. So if we build in all the increases, you can see we become positive there. Um, that's with our 2% and changing the recycling and those roll-off charges. So the goal is to you know, kind of keep, keep steady on that and then keep our cash balance steady. We don't reach the targets that I've set, but I'm trying to look out as, as we manage that cash balance and, and maintain. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, in terms of the, and this might, might be for Guy too, having looked at the um, pile of the wood, you know how we have trunks out there that are huge in with all kinds of other small stuff and it's all kind of mixed. And we ran over, I think, I just, tell me, was it, what was it 125,000? Thousand or spent 113 to grind the trees. Yeah, is that what you're saying? Yeah, the extra yep. that we didn't normally we normally would recoup some of that from the other contractor. So we had an extra cost this year on that area. Yeah, that's so affecting our our bottom line quite a bit. Yeah. Just my question to the question then: Are we charging enough based on what we've seen, and then clean, <coughs> cleaning up that big amount we have to to really not have that? Hit us again in the next year. That's my only thing. Question about this whole. That's what we're hoping with a dollar fifty per month charge. Yeah. The only thing we're charging now is non-resident disposal at fifteen dollars per cubic yard. So you, as a resident, you bring a tree out there. There's no charge right now. And in the past, that worked fine when we didn't have a charge to get rid of it, or it was three thousand dollars a year for grinding service because there was a market for those chips. But now, um, last year, there was no market for them. We still weren't charging residents, but we had to pay to dispose of it. So we spent that 113, but we did not have a revenue source to pay for it. Thus, the dollar 50 that we want to put in, and then we're estimating that at 60,000 a year, not 113, but 60,000, have that contractor locked into a contract, and they come quarterly, so we don't get a great big pile anymore. And it, it we keep, we always keep grinding. We're just you know, the consistency aspect. Mr. Thank Chair. You. Bill, can you, can you tell uh, Council Member Speedall what that dollar fifty would generate in a year? I think that's I'm kind think, of what you're, you Okay, I'm thinking sure that maybe that'll generate 90,000. Um, so we're generating more than the 60. We have staff time that works with those trees as well. So some of that cost above the 60. Um, there's one other thing in the whole refuse fund I didn't mention yet. Guy, you know what I'm gonna say. Um, citywide cleanup. <laughs> Looking at Ben. Before we talk about Mr. Chair, just for okay. follow up, if I could, on that. Um, having talked to the people at the landfill, I know I don't have them there to question. I know, but I mean, Guy, you, you're pretty well aware of this. Aware of this. The big trees. Um, have we made enough accommodation? Or I mean, I thought of having an, an excess charge or something for out of. We just have this one charge for the wood products coming in basically and we're charging people out of town a, a fee but to me the cost there's a large cost for these big trunks that come in huge trunks compared to grinding up stuff the size of your wrist or you know are we really being realistic in what we charge for those big trunks coming in from outside I mean I I just don't like to add more to our taxpayers when when some of those costs are coming in from tree trimmers who are operating the area it's a cheap dump and those trunks are massive we looked at that and um, we almost doubled that rate from yeah. 8 to 15, I think. Uh -huh. So we think we're covered. Um, the 90 the will take care of, of the it. Then. Large okay. trees that are coming in are our own boulevard trees from the Dutch Elm program. Okay. So well, you know covered. that better than I do. We, yeah. Mr. Chair, thank covered. you. Is, is there a benefit in keeping the big trunks separate from the mass of brush type stuff? I mean, I know it's probably tough to do, but. Yeah, because when a contractor brings it in on a truck, it's obviously all in one. Right. But sometimes, um, I mean, I, 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 when I was out, when I was out there one time, I mean, there was a guy just that had literally like a truckload of those, and I mean, they they obviously just get dumped on the same pile. Yeah. The contract grinder, he would definitely prefer that because he can burn through that stuff, the smaller stuff, real quick. Yeah. In the scheme of things, if we're doing everything to have that mixed in there, 
um, if he's going to do everything, it doesn't really make that yeah. much difference. And then he's going to. A follow-up question is: We grind all this stuff. What do we? I mean, before obviously the chips kind of went and were burnt and, and made renewable energy probably. But what happens to all the chips now? Are we just storing them? Right now they are stockpiled. Because at some point we're going to have a cost to. I mean, right. we, yeah, you know, at some point we have to think about. You know, we can't. Is that? Eventually, there'll be more chips than mm -hmm. there is landfill. One of the two contractors that we did use yeah. last year does have an outlet now. He's drying the chips down, and then he, he is selling them for uh, poultry bedding. Right. Um, and then that Fiberman uh, yep. wood pulp plant. Yeah, the Benson. May yeah, Benson. May reopen to, uh, you know, to take the some. Chips, so right. Uh, between those two outlets, we're hoping we can get rid of them. Right. And then we do offer for residents wood chips for landscaping. Yeah. That's a tiny I know. Problem. I was going to say yeah. it's <laughs> a <laughs> minuscule. Yeah. And, that's, and that's, I mean, again, it's just more of the, to put up out there on the horizon that if we don't, if we can't physically find a home for the chips at some point in time, they'll come back to haunt us too. Yeah. Well, are, I think, are we able to, to bring those over to the burner? Can they burn wood chips? We can check into that. Yeah, uh, you have to have a fluidized bed of some description. It's it's not as simple as it. Okay. It, it, it sounds simple, but it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. Just as simple. Yeah, it's yeah. not as simple to just burn it on site and get rid no. of the ash. Either, no. So. no. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to suggest that we consider a surcharge on the large trunks coming in from outside the city, because to me, the one size fits all for the little brush and stuff doesn't compensate for the loss we could get. <coughs> Let's just say, what if? What if somebody, you know, we had a big windstorm or whatever, we had somebody coming, lots of those trunks coming in. We could be in a position, you know, you know with the 90,000 savings even, where we would be in a negative position again. And I, I hate to see that on the citizens. I'd rather see it a surcharge that would take care of the unforeseen mm -hmm. possibility of that being conservative. You know, yeah. and it's not, it's not any skin on if anyone's nose unless they use it. But if they come in with a bunch of big trunks and measure, you know, whatever you want to set out there, what they say, I just think we should have that option. I'd like to suggest we that, look at that we look at it. If it were a mm -hmm. catastrophic event, yeah. though, we could reject any of that. Well, access. let's say it's a semi-catastrophic event. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a county issue. But you know, send, send them, send them they out go where it's the cheapest. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we okay. can certainly look at that because our intent, too, is if a non-resident tree comes in there, it should be fully funded by the person bringing it in. I mean, yeah, there should be no cost borne by the city residents for that. Um, in talking with the people at the landfill, there's not much that's coming in from outside of town, they say. Now, we're, we're making sure that they card for that, like we card at the liquor store. <laughs> um, we have brought that up to make sure, because we, we want to make sure that if it's a non-resident, you do need to pay those appropriate fees. So. Um, so I was going to talk just briefly, and you're going to be happy to know the refuse fund is the longest portion of this. But um, citywide cleanup, we've talked about that. We're throwing around ideas. We haven't built anything in as far as a, a revenue source for that or whatnot. What we're throwing around is if we do that, could we do like something in each ward where people could probably bring their things to that, have a cleanup, have a cleanup time instead of going door to door picking up, do you know a location in each ward we're throwing that around if we could build that in and fund it through this without a you know because we have no idea what this would cost us and you know try to have some limits on things but and then we could go forward and look how can we fund that but if we need to do it the first year figure it out we'll work on that so that was a note on that when we did that the last time we had a lot of stuff come in from the townships that's something we would have to and that's Part of the reason of having it in each of the four wards, they would deliver it to the location and show proof of uh, residency. Okay. And no tractor tires allowed, no, really. Yeah, we have no <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to the sewer fund. Um, again, the same scenarios here. Where we're at today, you can see we have changed in that position the last couple years where actually that has gone negative. We are okay with that because in 2017, our current year, our depreciation is changing. Um, it's the our sewer plant from 1981 is becoming fully depreciated this year, so those expenses are going down. So 
um, we start swinging back the other way. But I am recommending a 3% increase to the sewer fund rates. Again, it's been three years since we did that. Um, so here's if we did nothing again with revenues, but you have increasing costs each year, um, you can see again the purple bar starting to um, dip down as we go there. You can see from 17 to 18 where we swing positive in the net change in that position, that's the depreciation going off from like 800, 900,000 of depreciation down to five to 600,000 of depreciation per year. Um, so that's if we do nothing. Same scenario with the cash balance. You're gonna start spending that down. That's why it's on a, a downhill slide. The capital improvements, you can see we're going from 1.585 you know, each year. I'll just let you look at those. Um, various improvements throughout the city that would be funded through the sewer fund. No debt issuances here. We're paying cash for what we're doing. Um, so um, looking at these um, rates then with a 3% and we're going from on a 5 eighths meter, that's what most people have, um, going from 814 to 838. Now for a resident, for the 5 eighths, 3 quarters and 1 inch, they're all the same flat charge because we're saying in your household, basically the size of that meter you know you're having the same normal of drainage when you get into the bigger meters for a residential that's more for if you have a large sprinkler system in your yard or something again doesn't affect the sewer fund so that's why um, you know we have those lower rates but you do have more access to the system um, really the majority of our customers are all, all up at the top um, Beth, i think we were saying we can hardly even look at the rest of the schedule it's really what's happening on top, but we do have it in place. Flow rates, this um, 3% there as well, per thousand gallons, going from 402 to 414. That's residential. Commercial then, um, each graduated. And the one thing I did on this one is from a three quarter meter to a six um, inch meter. I tweaked those a little bit. Some of those may be different than a 3% because I went back to the original 1981 study and looked at the conversion factors and somewhere along the way we got a little off with the graduated increases from 5 eighths to 3 quarters. So I'm adjusting those back in line. <clears throat> we have no 6 inch meters out there, but it's on our schedule. So that increase, it's irrelevant at this point. There's no one has them. There's one customer that has a 4 inch. So again, most of these are on the lower end, but to kind of put that in perspective. So again, 3%, but then I'm doing the calculations going down by meter according to um, their capacity draw on the you know, use of the system. Mr. Chair, I had a question about the, um, cash, the cash balance or whatever. For some reason, and I wanted to just, from your memory or can you, in general, we, if you were to pull that back to like 2010 or, or I don't know, over the, the last five years leading up to 2016. Yeah. Um, were we at a, did we have a reserve of 12 million at one point? Or no, that? we're kind of at our high point now. Actually, we have been okay. ramping up that cash balance as we're fully depreciating that plant. So this really is the point where we should probably have the hit a peak right now because we've been covering our depreciation each year. Um, we want to make sure we always cover depreciation because that's the using up of your assets. But no, we've, we've gained each year the last few years. So. One, and then one more. Uh, the underground, I mean, we don't see, obviously, you know, we see a lot of the city, but we don't see the infrastructure of sewer. Yep. Um, our, as we look to improving and replacing uh, ages, you're going to look at that now. Is that the next thing? or? Uh, we look at that all the time. Okay. Um, so. And that's what this bar chart is of capital improvements. This is not all out at the sewer plant. We're maybe doing three to five hundred thousand dollars a year in the sewer plant. The rest of that is infrastructure out under the ground in the street. So engineering each year lays out that capital improvement plan of where are those sewers bad? Where could we reline some versus where do we have to fully dig them up and replace them? So they do both. So that's that's all built in the capital dollars that were and a lot of that is done with street improvement too I I would think also absolutely yep same thing we do with we have a whole street management pavement management program where Brian is intentionally picking which streets will work on by their pavement condition same thing with the utility lines underneath before we go and tear up a street we want to make sure do we need to do that utilities now so we don't tear it up again in five years so mm -hmm. 
So that was the sewer. Um, if we include those increases, you can see we want to stay positive on all of that so that we are able to continue to fund that infrastructure. I mean, don't kid ourselves, we have aging infrastructure under the streets, so very important that we do that. Again, cash balances, I look at a whole subsequent year of expenditures plus the capital plus any principal on these. But to try and mirror it, mirror it to that target. Where do we find with um, sewer? Again, kind of in the middle of the road with the rates. So we're um, you know, not an outlier there is why I want to show you these charts. Stormwater fund, I'll point out one thing, 2012, you see that huge purple bar? That is um, contributed capital going in. That's um, assets related in stormwater to the um, Tower Road and Bridge project that were funded elsewhere. Scott, did you come up? He's got to leave. Brent, one of you. I'm picking this new guy. Get the newbie up here. It's mean. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Anthony. <coughs> Safe to assume you don't want to hear the whole presentation uh, uh, again on Monday? I can, I can read. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Just the party you're going to miss. There you go. All right, so stormwater fund. Um, operations we have some decline in this fund it's because we've been adding more expense to this fund um, MS4 I believe it's called is that right guy our stormwater management program um, our GIS employee one quarter of his time has been allocated to this because he's doing the stormwater enforcement um, street sweeping that was added in, in the last years as well so we've had some you know expenses go to this fund if we do nothing again with revenue, same scenario, you spend down your cash, you have these net losses if we never increase revenue but we have costs going up. We have a bonding built in here that would go in with a permanent improvement revolving fund bond. That's our infrastructure bonds that we issue. This would be if we do something up at Lake Alice, the expenses are in there but we put bonding in there to fund it as well as the funding source. So that's all built in. Some of that was in on the sewer fund as well. Again, the cash plummets if we never raise revenues, but we have increasing expenses. Here's those capital improvements. In 2017, in the CIP plan, the capital improvement plan, is Lake Alice for that $800,000 of that 1.15. So if you as a council choose to do something there, we would need to bond for that because we don't have the cash readily available in this, in this fund, then we have to pay for it over time. There's the improvements going out from the CIP plan. If we do increases and I'm looking at 50 cents a year going up is what I'm projecting so we're at 625 now going to 675 then um, 725 um, to you know to over the long haul bring that and keep it positive and then trying to mirror a target again we're all you notice we're under that a little bit maybe that conservative you know again estimating there's just showing what the storm sewer rates would be, 625 to 675 for that residential customer, or 50 cents. Okay, we're a little bit towards the higher end when we're compared to other cities, but um, in talking with Brian and even other cities, if you're down in the lower area, you are most likely funding your storm water another way, be it through um, you know, your PIR bonds or whatnot. Um, prior to having this stormwater fund, we funded it through the general fund. This is a fairly new fund for the cities from the mid 90s, um, but we're at 625, and um, I'm a broken record. We have lots of stormwater needs, infrastructure. When we do water sewer, we're doing storm as well. So, water fund operations. This is the last fund. Now we're going to talk about today. Um, again, bringing us to 2016, we've done. Um, in 2014 and 15, we did 10% increases both of those years. We pushed those towards the flat charges. So the flat charges went up more than 10%, but the flow charges stayed the same. Because when, when we've been looking at that whole water study, we are much more heavy on the fixed charges. So we're putting that to the fixed revenue portion. Same scenario, um, if we don't increase revenues but we have increasing expenses, we would look at some bonding in this fund for a couple million dollars again as well. Some of that um, 
would be the water line that goes through Woodland Heights. Um, that's in, paid for by the water fund, but we have a reimbursement resolution. We'd probably include that in some bonding as well as future projects. Cash balance again, if we um, don't do anything with the revenue, we are spending down that savings account. There's our capital um, that's happening in water, so a lot of water needs out there. Um, we're including some estimates for the water plant of like $500,000 a year is what we're looking at. We have a good plant, it's an old plant, but it is working well, um, and we've been doing upgrades each year to things to it. We'll probably never get rid of that plant. It'll be a rehab of what's there in place. So um, we don't foresee that we would ever scrap that and start new, because we do have a good plant out there. So I want to give some reassurance on that. So looking at a 5% increase in the water rates, like I said about the flat and the flow, pushing that all to the flat charges. Um, so it actually becomes like a 12 and a half to the flat and nothing to the, fl to the flow charges to equal out to be about a five in general. And that's the tier structure, so that would remain unchanged. Here's the water rates, taking those flat charges and going up that 12 and a half so that the net to the water bill goes 5%. And then um, with those increases built in, keeping us positive there, um, cash balance there, doing better on that, um, bringing that positive. And this chart, question? If I could, the commercial rate, um, when was the last time? I, I might have that we changed these? Yeah. The commercial uh, rate. Two years ago, 2015. And so commercial and residential change. Correct. Then. And that's typically how you do it? Yep. Yeah, we keep them the same. The commercial has um, a separate tier structure, mm -hmm. but again, unchanged. But then the flat charges, Beth, that's correct, isn't That's um, whatever commercial or residential, if that's the meter you have, that's your flat charge, right? Good. Okay. For the water. For the water, correct. Sewer is different. Um, on these charts, I want to call your attention to this one compares Fergus Falls with other people that responded that are softening plants. Um, because Fergus Falls, we soften the water so you and your home don't have to have a water softener. So it's done at the plant. That's more expensive and that's why there's um, you know, that number of cities that um, were surveyed that have softening. And you can see where we land versus those that have softening. And then we show you where we land in Minnesota, um, greater Minnesota, outstate. So this is everyone, that's those with softening plants, and we're a softening plant. And then we're back to the bill that we started with at the beginning, $5.46 month, um, per month increase then is what we're estimating if you are a 6,000 gallon customer. Our average customer is like 4,200 gallons, but we did this so we could be comparable with those charts that AE2S puts out. Again, about a family of four here is what we estimate. And then where rates could go in the future is, like I said, we project out through 2027. That just shows under current what we would recommend doing. We'll come back to you every year. You'd only be approving this year's change, not future years. And I think, oh, the rate schedule, we're here today. Um, go to council on Monday. The refuse fund, everything related to the refuse fund, the tree management fee, recycling, all that in the <coughs> refuse fund, the water and the storm, happening in March, the bills that go out the end of March. Sewer, not until April, because we reset everyone's sewer rate in April, so if we did it in March, we'd be redoing it again in April. That wouldn't make sense. Let's do it once, so. That's our calendar. That's my presentation. <laughs> do we have a motion to have this go to the full council? Yeah. I make the motion. Okay. Second. Rod, second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. I'm going to read my papers. Thank you. Okay. I hope all the rest of your presentations aren't. No, I'll be real quick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, item number four budget adjustments. Bill. Okay, in your packet, this is a housekeeping item. We have two 2016 budget adjustments and one for 2017. 
So moving, it's a lateral move, 45,605 from the general government area for benefits owed over to engineering for benefits owed. So just, no, you know, just a lateral move within the general fund. Then increasing library budgets, 3,687 because they received some donations. So donations up, expenses then so they can spend that. 2017 budget, our first forfeiture in of 1,274, same thing, increase the revenue, increase the expense. That's all for those budget adjustments. Your Honor, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Now uh, we have to deal with him. No. <laughs> when the library, for instance, you know, anything, not just, but if something is raised and we're allowing that to go up, does yep. that assume then in the next year that that carries, or how do you? Nope, what it does do is, so when we increase this, we budget zero for these. So in the library, donations, we always set that at zero so that we deal with it every time they come in because we don't know what's coming sure. in. So we don't inflate budgets because we got donations one year. We start it over again the next year at zero. Okay, thanks. Motion to accept that. Motion, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Consensus? Yep. RTC insurance coverage discussion. Okay, figured I better bring this to you. Um, now that we've put some money into the actual buildings up there, we've put about $300,000 into the roofs and into some masonry, masonry repairs. Um, we don't have property insurance on the Kirkbride structure. We have liability insurance everywhere in the city. Whenever we acquire property, our liability insurance um, extends to that. But we have not had property insurance because we've always had the state grant dollars. If something happened up there, you most likely wouldn't rebuild it. You'd use the state grant. In essence, demo was taken care of for you by some accident, and then you'd have to clean it up. Um, well, now you know we don't have state dollars. It's looking good for us to getting some of that reinstated in the legislature. It's been introduced. Um, and we've put state money in of about 300000 I talked to the League of Cities to see what they could come up with. Um, what they've come up with is a million dollars per occurrence. So something happens this month, we'd have a million dollar coverage for that occurrence. If something happened three months later, you'd have again a million dollars coverage for that occurrence. And they did, I did discuss through the debris and cleanup. You know, usually it's 25% of the limit is for debris and cleanup. They have matched that million dollars for that um, is what they would do. Um, they are kicking around if we wanted higher limits, but they don't have anything for me yet. Um, but this is expensive coverage. Um, if you wanted this, a million dollar coverage, when it applies to our other city deductibles of 10,000 per occurrence, 20,000 aggregate, and once you reach an aggregate, then you have at least a thousand dollar maintenance deductible. That is 26,663 a year for that coverage. To put that in perspective, City Hall here, we have $4.8 million of coverage on this building for $3,970. So for a million dollars up there, it's $27,000. Or they gave that $100,000 per occurrence deductible and brings it down to eleven nine. I don't know if you want to do this. I don't even, I don't know if I even have a recommendation for you, but it, I at least needed to bring it up. And we're hoping that we get that 1.91 back. So, but we won't know till the legislative session is done. So what are your thoughts? I think at this point we just use that for information only. And that's what we did years ago. We brought this to you on the whole facility and at that time it was forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. Years ago um, when we took ownership out of it, we explored it and, okay. <laughs> okay, item number six, airport snow removal equipment. And this is for Brian, because um, he couldn't be with us here today. Um, as you recall, we're receiving grant funding through the FFA to purchase a new, it's basically, it's a snow plow truck, is that right? And um, what are you laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> Did I say FFA? I think it's FAA, right? <laughs> you know what I mean, the airport club. <laughs> so um, we're purchasing a 
2017 International Navistar. We're purchasing the chassis and then that from Maney International. It'll, the chassis would get shipped to MB. Right, Guy, you can, um, I'm looking for this here. The MB facilities in Wisconsin. And then this would be done in September of 2017. So we've already you know, applied for the grant. We received the grant. They've now said we can go forward with the purchase. We'd be purchasing through state contracts. So that's part of the action here today. We'd be recommending you go ahead and make this purchase from state contract. Total cost here is $492,959.42. The FAA portion is $443,663.48. MnDOT, $20,211.34. And the city's portion, $29,084.61. And that would come out of our equipment fund because the previous one was always rented back to that fund. So huge grant dollars here on this. Um, so naturally, I recommend you go forward with this. And this went through the airport commission as well. Is there a motion to go forward? I'll make that. Rod, second. Tom, second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, carried. Okay, item number seven, Mighty Ducks Zamboni Grant, Steve Plaza. Good afternoon. Uh, much like the snowplow, uh, the city applied for a grant for an electric Zamboni through the Mighty Duck program, James uh, Metzen Mighty Duck Foundation, and we received that. We're at the point of purchasing two electric Zambonis and replacing our gas propane Zambonis up at the community arena. We'd like to go forward and order those. Uh, for a total of two resurfacers, it's $278,470. Out of that, uh, $135,161 will be on grant from the uh, Mighty Duck uh, portion. Uh, we have a tr trade-in value of $51,000 for our current propane they would take them away and it would be a, a cash out of the city of eighty four thousand one hundred sixty two dollars and that money would come out of the equipment fund also because we do pay rent on those Zambonis over the years I'm um, recommending that we approve that it's a it's a good deal is there a motion to approve Rod one second Tom. any discussion got one question on it yep um, so if I have it right, the total cost the city's going to end up putting in is eighty-four thousand. Correct. And and then the other the other question then, as far as our user fees and I know it's coming out of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, Bill, can you address that? You know what I'm going to ask. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. When like Steve mentions that we rent those, that's an interdepartmental charge. So, the equipment fund charges the arena program or the. Um, the community arena for um, equipment each year. It covers depreciation on it so that we recover our costs plus inflation when we buy it again, plus the maintenance that happens throughout. That goes into that budget and then that budget gets allocated out to the user groups and the city is one portion of that, 11.5% of it. So we pay 11.5, the other user groups are paying the rent on that 84,000 then to recoup mm. it. Right. And you're satisfied with, we had this discussion earlier about making sure that the rates uh, allow us to recoup what we need and, you know, they're, and you're satisfied that those rates remain uh, effective or equitable or whatever uh, from the original agreement, right? Yep, in the actual, the community arena agreements? Yeah. Yep, I mean, we're, we're operating under those agreements and, and what they say. So that's, um, you know, that's a policy decision if, you know, our 11.5% is covering that open skate time and having the facility and, and whatnot. Sure. But Thank you. Yep. And you actually look at those rates each year, right? And they're adjusted. Correct. With the budget. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. Uh, item number eight, Mayor's Monarch Pledge. Steve Plaza and Molly Stoddard. Short one is here. Looks like okay. Molly's going to speak. I guess so. I'm Molly. I work at Prairie Wetlands for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Thanks for letting me join you this afternoon. The Mayor's Monarch, Mayor's Monarch Pledge is an initiative, an initiative offered by the National Wildlife Federation 
a private nonprofit organization, and it's nationwide. They are um, using this initiative as a way to involve cities and mayors in helping monarch butterflies because over the last 20 years, the monarchs have declined, their numbers have declined um, by 90%. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the agency I do work for, is um, considering that species right now for the endangered species list. So um, National Wildlife Federation is inviting mayors and communities to get involved through the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. I have a copy of the pledge here I can pass around if you're interested. It's also available on National Wildlife Federation's website. Would you like me to pass that? I don't sure, like know about that. They have that. Okay. Oh. Awesome. So you should have a copy of that in your packet. Awesome. Yeah. It looks like that. And you might have a proclamation as well. So the way the Mayor's Monarch uh, Pledge, I can't have a hard time saying this, the way it works is that it has to be the mayor or um, city executive to complete the pledge online. It's a very simple <laughs> pledge, mainly asking for contact information, and then National Wildlife Federation contacts them directly within a few days. Um, it also asks uh, for, you, for the mayor to specify actions that would be taken. There's a list to choose from. Um, and then the four, third step is to take action over the next 12 months and later then report progress made on those actions. There's three different levels of actions that can be taken. One is to take at least three actions or more. That's the Mayor's Monarch Pledge level. The next level up is eight or more actions for the leadership circle, and the third one is to do all 24 actions. That's the champions level. There are only two cities or two mayors that have done that. 76 have done the leadership circle and 162 the, the minimum mayor's monarch pledge. One of the actions um, called for is for the mayor to sign a proclamation. So you have a copy of a proclamation in your folder that Last week, fourth graders in Mr. McAllister's afternoon prairie science class at Prairie Wetlands, um, we worked together with them to craft that, that wording. They contributed some of their own words to it about monarchs. And um, what we'd like to suggest is that the um, proclamation be presented at the city council meeting on Monday evening. The students are invited to come and present that and read it with Mayor Shire, um, but of course we want to bring you all in on the process and answer questions or address any concerns you might have. Ben. That's a that's a very good point. So um, you're going to actually do more than the three things, but oh, we, we were already doing the majority of things on that. Is that okay? Yep. We talked about that that middle area, the eight or more. Easily, we're doing many of those things in Fergus Falls already. Good. Good. Um, there's no cost that I know of to doing them. Um, there are things that are administrative changes, perhaps, or um, like he said, things that we already have going on. Maybe things that are coming up that could be easily incorporated. Um, so, yeah, we, we seem to be a monarch city over already, <laughs> if you will, but, um. And Mr. Mayor, you would like to do this? Absolutely. My daughter helped draft the project. <laughs> <laughs> she did. I assume she'll be here Monday night if this all goes forward. Okay. Yep. So, um, that's all good stuff. Anything else? Oh, sure. No problem. Do we have a motion? Yeah. Rod. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign, carry. All right, thank you so much. See you thank Monday you. night. Aura Development Agreement, Amy Baldwin. Aura. 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 Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, good you. afternoon. Uh, as indicated in the memo within your packet, uh, the city has received a request to uh, provide a consent to a uh, collateral assignment of the Aura Capital LLC development agreement and the related tax increment financing note. 
uh, back in September 2016, the City Council approved the establishment of a new tax increment financing district and the de associated development agreement that outlined the terms and conditions of the city's assistance through tax increment financing to Aura uh, Capital doing business as Aura Fabricators, um, which is well under construction if folks haven't seen. It's a pretty <coughs> impressive building going up out there. And uh, like I mentioned, a request has come in for an assignment of that development agreement and the tax increment financing note to MMCDC, or the Midwest Minnesota Community Development Corporation, which is the primary lender on that project. They are utilizing new market tax credits as part of this project, and MMCDC is a lender um, that has, in previous years, received an allocation of those tax credits. And so um, they're the lead lender on the project. The fact that it's new market tax credit isn't um, particularly relevant, but um, they are the lead lender, and um, they would like to have that tax increment financing note as collateral to that loan that they have. And um, the, uh, you know, really, it, just to note that the this assignment really puts um, is a positive thing for us because it puts uh, MMCDC in um, a position to ensure that that project gets built, occupied, and that taxes are generated to pay that note. So it's in their best interest to, you know, should something happen with the project and it stalls out prior to completion of construction, MMCDC would step in and uh, um, ensure that the project gets constructed and be uh, very motivated to get a tenant within that building. You know, things again are, are well underway, so we're not too concerned with that happening. <coughs> but should something happen that would change that, um, they would be in a place to do that with this assignment um, put in place. And then they would be receiving the revenues from that tax increment financing note um, directly as well, which is very typical in, in projects that are financed through tax increment financing, that the lead lender will get an assignment of that note put in place to help um, secure the lending. So um, be happy to answer any questions on that. Our, development attorney who drafted the original development agreement with this project did review both the consent um, document and the assignment agreement itself and had no concerns with that. So we would propose um, moving forward with authorization of this consent. So we have a motion to proceed with the authorization of consent. All the motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Frank, second. We need discussion. Mr. Chair, um, having gone through this, and it's a lot to digest in some ways, um, in other ways it seems fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. So appreciate your comments on clarifying that. I just had sure. a couple questions, if I could. Sure. Uh, the first one is, as I understand it, that the basic benefit to the city of Fergus Falls is the job creation in a TIF sense. Uh, most of the benefit mm -hmm. accrues to us through bringing in new jobs. That's correct, right? That's kind of uh, why Chair, we do it. Council Member Speedall, it would be the tax base, I, I would say, in addition to, you know, the tax base increase overall plus the, the jobs created certainly would be a benefit. Okay, yeah. And as I look at the original agreement that we have and understand that, that this allows the, the CDC to basically hold the majority position in, in this uh, TIF uh, agreement, right? So mm -hmm. that it transfers from aura to the CDC. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, Mr. Chair, um, that, and I don't, I'm assuming and, and, and well aware that we have a good representation um, by the legal side of this. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, assuming that that proposal is all legal, um, it's made with the developer, as I read it, you know, the, the agreement, the TIF agreement, and it has, it has um, aspects about the number of jobs, I think, 13, I'm just guessing, I can't remember now, but it, it, it's something like 13 jobs in front of me. created, mm -hmm. et cetera, mm -hmm. um, at so much an hour. Mm -hmm. So in the unlikely event that there would be a stalling or, you know, a failure of that project, the developer, um, my question was, I want to make sure that the promises and intent of the TIF agreements would be met going mm -hmm. forward in sure. a new business that might occupy it. So just let's yeah. say there was a, a trucker that wanted to buy it 
Mm -hmm. and create three jobs. Sure, I can comment on that. Uh, so. Chair, uh, Councilmember Speedall, the um, MMCDC would be, um, would ha if there's going to be a modification for a different tenant to be in place, because we do refer to, you know, uh, Aura Fabricators and Aura Capital are two different entities already. So mm -hmm. um, MMCDC needs, to, if there's going to be a change of someone other than uh, what's indicated in that development agreement, they would have to come back for a modification. Otherwise, they'd be in default of the agreement and not receive those TIF payments. Okay. So it would be a, a condition of default that they'd have to cure or request a modification okay. to the development agreement. And we wish them well and know what's going to go forward probably, but I absolutely. just want to make sure we're covering our, yep. you know, our investment. Yep, absolutely. Right. We want to ensure that as well. Yeah. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carry. Thank you. Consent or? Uh, can I go on the consent or do you want to call the full council? I think I can go on the consent. Okay. Okay, item number 10. We get Billy back again. Billy. <laughs> Special this, assessment this deferral. Uh, just the other day, we received an application for a deferral of special assessments up on the Minnesota Avenue project. Um, so this is for Scott Davis at 1404 East Minnesota Avenue. Um, he did complete uh, the application we have on file. Um, this um, deals with the resolution that was passed back in 2006 of the <coughs> types of deferrals that are available, and one of them is a disability deferral, and you have to s meet certain income um, limitations. And um, he appears to qualify um, for those. So I bring that before you. Um, the principal balance of this assessment is $8,619.68. Um, the deferral, how it works is this would be a permanent deferral, which means that it would be on for 30 years. Um, but when a person t um, uh, receives this deferral, uh, if they pass away, then that assessment becomes active. If they sell their home, it becomes active, or if they... Um, if the disability um, status is removed, then it becomes active. Uh, this would be at the interest rate <coughs> adopted at the final cost hearing. This interest rate is already in place at 4.5%. And um, interest does accrue during the life of this deferral. It, it's, um, so it's ticking along with interest throughout, but that, um, that's on the application and you know, the applicant knows this. So um, we have very few of these, but we do have some out there. So I have that before you and recommend that you approve that. Is there a motion to recommend? Second. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. Thank you. That can go on the consent also. Is there any further business to become to come before this committee? We are adjourned. Basically, Sorry it took so long. Down.